God, we thank you that we're in right standing with you because of your son. God, right now, I just want to thank you for all the hard times, Lord, for all those moments when we, God, perhaps don't understand why they're happening. Lord, your word just reminds us that you're doing something. Consider it pure joy when we face trials and tribulations and all these things, Lord. Father, we know that it's producing steadfastness in the faith. God, it's doing something. So, Lord, I pray that you would remind us about that truth tonight. God, as we continue to sing, Lord, God, bless this time as we draw near to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
for your hope, the hope of salvation, Lord. But as we've seen, we pray that you would give us boldness in your Holy Spirit, Lord. Confidence in what you've done. Confidence in your word, Lord, because you tell the truth. Your word is faithful. It's trustworthy. 
as you're turning to Jeremiah, I just have a really encouraging story I want to share with you guys. Um, how many of you ever kind of lose a little bit of hope in prayer when you're praying for something? And you pray and you pray and you pray and it just seems like God's not listening or like nothing's happening. So um, yesterday, one of our elders, Rick Cervini, uh, I think you all know Rick. He's been part of our church since day one. He and his wife, Julie. And he was here for the noon prayer like he always is. He leads that. And he popped into my office. We talked for a few minutes and he left. I was in the middle of a meeting, but he called. And Rick doesn't usually call me in the midst of the workday. So I answered the phone and Rick was in tears. He was almost hysterical. And he said, Randy, you're never going to believe what happened. And I'm bracing myself. You know, and I'm thinking, did something happen to Julie or one of his kids or one of the grandkids? And Brian and I were meeting, and I just looked across the desk at Brian like, oh, my gosh, I'm about to get some terrible news. And Rick says, my brother Chuck just called me. He's en route to the hospital. He can't breathe. And he told me, Rick, I think this is it. I think I'm dying. And so Rick started sharing the gospel with him. He's shared the gospel with his brother in the past, and his brother has been unreceptive. And Rick shared the gospel yesterday, and his brother Chuck prayed to receive Christ en route to the hospital. And Rick was just, and I was ecstatic because I don't need more bad news right now. And so in the midst of of all this, it was so cool. But I remembered something. That's a week ago, this past Wednesday night, We're having our pre-service prayer meeting, and I always participate through Zoom because I'm usually driving in right at about 6 o'clock. And Rick was sharing. He said, hey, guys, I want to share with you a dream I had. He said, "Um, I've never had a dream like this before. He said, but I was walking in my neighborhood, and some people walked up to me, and I just boldly shared the gospel, and they got saved. And... We all kind of made small talk, and then all of a sudden it hit me. I said, Rick, I think that dream was prophetic, and you need to be preparing yourself because I think God is setting you up for something. And here, six days later, it's it's his brother, and he got the privilege of leading his brother to Christ. Now, I haven't spoken to Rick. He wasn't in the prayer meeting, so I assume he's en route to New York. He said he was going to go see his brother. And so keep him in prayer. But listen, the Scriptures teach us not to lose hope and to pray always. And that's a great example. So if you're here tonight and you're saying, hey, I'm starting to lose hope in some things, uh, my word to you, and I know it comes straight from the Lord, is don't give up hope. Pray always and trust that God is going to work in his time. Amen? Let's pray real quick. Father, thank you for Rick and his boldness, Lord, and, and that he saw that this was one of those crucial moments that he couldn't just let slip by. And he shared Christ And his brother Chuck asked for forgiveness for his sin and received Christ as his Savior. And Lord, we're going to see one more person in heaven when we get there, and that is so exciting. Tonight, Lord, as we look at the book of Jeremiah, we're going to see the exact opposite. We're going to see the continued story of a bold man named Jeremiah who's been sharing the truth with an entire nation and with the leaders And they continue to not listen. And they continue to move towards judgment. And we pray tonight, Lord, that as we study these two chapters, that you would speak to us about areas of our own life where we're hard-hearted, Lord, where you're speaking. And through circumstances, you're working and we are ignoring you. And we want to ask tonight, Lord, that you would cause us to have ears to hear and lives to respond. We praise you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. We have two uh, very challenging chapters in front of us. Just to review, our our Wednesday night study in Jeremiah is titled Messages to a Backsliding Nation. So it's very, very appropriate for the United States of America at this time that we're living in. And tonight we come to a major turning point in the book of Jeremiah. In the first 19 chapters, we've seen Jeremiah preach nine very specific messages to nine very specific audiences, and Jeremiah's messages all followed a pattern. It began when Jeremiah denounced the sins of the nation, and then he warned that God's judgment was coming in the form of the Babylonian 
invasion. And then he offered the nation hope if they would simply confess their sins and they would repent. And for 19 chapters, we have seen Jeremiah ignored and we've seen him opposed, but we've not seen Jeremiah suffer any physical persecution until last week when we got to chapter 20. And at the beginning of chapter 20, a high-ranking priest from the temple whose name was Pashur, he had Jeremiah arrested, he had him beaten, and he had him publicly humiliated. And what we learned last week is that Pashur's actions reflected the heart of the nation. The people didn't want to hear Jeremiah's message. They didn't want to respond. And even though he warned them, Last week, Pashur's actions sealed the fate of the nation. And from this point on, as you're going to see, and you have to pay attention to the chronology, because timing is really important as we move forward throughout the book, but you're going to see that Jeremiah's message of hope to the nation of Judah is now replaced with the message of God's absolute and certain judgment. So tonight's message is titled, God's Message to kings, and we'll study Jeremiah chapters 21 and 22. So if you look at verse 1 of chapter 21, before we even start reading, I I want you to just go about halfway through the verse. I want you to look at two words that are going to set the scene for us tonight, and it is, they are the words, King Zedekiah. And these two words tell us when chapter 21 took place. It is now about 20 years later than the events that we studied last week in chapter 20. And one of the things about studying Jeremiah that I've told you over and over is that the book does not, is not recorded in chronological order. So we're jumping ahead really 17 years in chapter 21. And then when we get to chapter 22, we're going to jump back in time to where we were. And then we're going to go ahead again. So it's kind of mind blowing. I'll show you some charts to help you figure it all out. But it's the year 588 BC now, and we know this because this guy Zedekiah was the king of Judah just before Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC. So so we're literally two years or less from the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem right now. And a lot of activity has taken place between last week's study and this week's study. So Let's get oriented by looking up at the screen. I'm going to give you a little bit of a timeline so that you can understand where we are. Babylon invaded Judah three different times. We call them the first, second, and third Babylonian invasions. And if you look on the left of your screen, uh, it began when Nebuchadnezzar first invaded Judah in 605 BC, and that was during the reign of a king named Jehoiakim. Nebuchadnezzar sieged the city, and he carried off the brightest and the best of the Jews at that time. That's when Daniel and his friends were taken to Babylon, and the events of the book of Daniel began to play out at the same time that other things were playing out back home in Judah. If you look at the middle of this slide, Nebuchadnezzar's second invasion took place in 598 B.C. during the reign of Jehoiakim. He carried off all the treasure from the temple and from the city. He carried off more people. And this is when the prophet Ezekiel and a lot of the priests and the leaders were carried off to Babylon. At that time, Nebuchadnezzar set up a puppet king in Judah, somebody that he could control. His given name was Matanyahu. But Nebuchadnezzar gave him the name Zedekiah. We're probably all familiar with Zedekiah. He ruled during Judah's final 11 years, and he'll be a major part of our study tonight. And then in 586 BC, Babylon destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and carried off all but the poorest of the poor from Judah to Babylon. And so what we're about to read here in chapter 21 took place in the final two years of Zedekiah's reign, just before the city was destroyed. So let's look at verse 21. We're going to, I'm sorry, chapter 21. We're going to call this Zedekiah's request and God's response. 
We're going to read verses 1 and 2. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, when King Zedekiah sent to him Pashur, the son of Melchiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, saying, Please inquire of the Lord for us. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, makes war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful works that the king may go away from us. Now, Zedekiah sends a couple of priests to see Jeremiah. And I want you to notice that one of them is named Pashur. You recognize him from last week? Go like this. Okay, now go like this. Same name, different guy. So I just love the Bible. Everybody's got the same name and you've got to figure out who these people really are. But you've got a priest named Pashur, not the same guy from last week, and then a priest named Zephaniah, not the prophet Zephaniah, from the book of Zephaniah. But Zedekiah the king sends these two guys to Jeremiah with a simple request. And he basically says, listen, I want you guys to tell Jeremiah, ask God what's going to happen. Now, now, we know that Nebuchadnezzar has attacked our city twice. He's carried people off. We know that God has prophesied that the city's going to be destroyed. But maybe, Jeremiah, you could just go to God and, and ask him, maybe that's not going to happen. And so, maybe God will have mercy on us. And maybe God will relent. And, and as you look at this, you realize that for over 30 years, Jeremiah has been confronting the sins of the nation of Judah and warning of this coming judgment. And now we're probably 18 months or two years at most as, as judgment is looming on the horizon. And the king comes and says, Jeremiah, hey, you know, could you go ask God what's going to happen? And it's like Jeremiah is saying, I've been telling you for 30 years what's going to happen. Nebuchadnezzar is going to destroy your city. Nebuchadnezzar is going to continue to carry people off captive. But isn't that human nature? I mean, it starts when we're little kids. If you take cookies, when I'm not looking, you're going to get grounded. And then a little kid waits till mom's not looking and goes in the kitchen. And what does he do? He takes cookies. What happens? He gets grounded. Ask my mom. She's here tonight, and she used to have to ground me all the time from stealing cookies out of the cookie jar. It's what we do. It's, it's human nature. And then, then we want to just go and ask God, hey, can you give us some good news? And I want you to notice Jeremiah's response. Verse 30, then Jeremiah said to them, thus you shall say to Zedekiah. So he tells these two priests, I'm going to give you a message. You take it back to the king. Verse 4, thus says the Lord God of Israel, behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands with which you fight against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans who besiege you outside the walls and I will assemble them in the midst of this city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm even in anger and fury and great wrath. I will strike the inhabitants of the city both man and beast and they shall die of a great pestilence. So Zedekiah basically asks, hey, is God going to do a miracle and turn Babylon around? And Jeremiah turns and he gives a fourfold response. The first thing he says we find in verse 4, he says, God is no longer for you. God is now against you. And he basically says, your weapons are useless. If you try to use your weapons, God's going to turn them back on you. The second thing he says is also in verse 4. Jeremiah says, listen, rather than turn Babylon around and send them home, God is going to cause them to breach your walls and they are going to find themselves encamped right in the middle of your city. The third thing comes from verse 5. Jeremiah says, rather than rescue you, God himself is going to fight against you. And in anger and strong wrath, he is going to oppose you. And then the fourth thing we find in verse 6, Jeremiah says to these guys, go tell the king that the inhabitants of the city are not going to be spared. They are going to die from the sword and they are going to die from pestilence. Now, we've been studying this book for 20 plus chapters now. We've seen Jeremiah warn them over and over and over that if they would repent, God would relent. But they haven't repented. And 
30 some years have gone by and now God's word is coming true. And so if you're new tonight, if this is your first time that you're with us, you need to understand that this wasn't God waking up in a bad mood one day and saying, no, I'm not going to help you. This was 30 to 40 years after God started warning the nation of Judah that judgment was coming, that he finally says, you need to know that I'm going to keep my word. God says, I've warned you. And now, since you've continued to ignore me, this is actually going to happen. So in verse 7, now the Lord sends a message directly to King Zedekiah. Look at verse 7. And afterwards says the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, his servants and the people and such as are left in this city from the pestilence and the sword and the famine. That sounds good, doesn't it? So far. So you keep reading and then God says, and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. And he shall strike them with the edge of the sword. He shall not spare them or have pity or mercy. So now Jeremiah, in a sense, looks at these two priests and he says, and God has a message for you to take directly to the king. And it's basically this, king, a bunch of your people are going to die from sword and from pestilence. But you and some of your family and your servants and others from the city, you're going to escape the sword and the pestilence. That's the good news. The bad news is that Nebuchadnezzar and his army is going to take you captive and take you to Babylon and there you will die. And so it's a very direct message given to Zedekiah. And what I want you to see is that Zedekiah asked Jeremiah for a feel-good message in the midst of a terrible circumstance. It's, it's like Zedekiah for years has been hearing, you are living in your sinful condition and if you'll repent, God will relent. And now, just before God is about to send total destruction, Zedekiah is bold enough to go and say to Jeremiah, hey, could, could you go talk to God for us and maybe he'll change his mind? And it's very interesting because his hard heart is just showing over and over and over. And instead, Jeremiah gives him a very sobering message. And he says, you have been sowing to the wind and you're about to reap the whirlwind. And so look up at the screen. I'm not going to have you turning all over the Old Testament tonight because it would just take us too long. But in 2 Kings 25, just a little bit after what we're reading, 18 months to two years or so, we see the end of this King Zedekiah. 2 Kings 25 verses 6 and 7. I'll set the scene if I can, just so these verses make sense. But Zedekiah rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had allowed him to be the king because he thought he would behave himself. But Zedekiah rebelled. And then when Nebuchadnezzar's forces breached the wall and they're coming into the city, Zedekiah and a group of his leaders fled to the plains. Nebuchadnezzar's men caught him. And that's where we pick it up. It says, so they took the king, Zedekiah, and they brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they pronounced judgment on him. Then they killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters, and took him to Babylon. So after ignoring, he was the king for 11 years, so let's just get rid of the last 30 years. Let's just talk about 11 years while he was king. And Jeremiah is saying, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. And this king continues to harden his heart and harden his heart. When it all caught up to him, the Babylonians murdered his sons so that the very last thing he would see was the death of his family. Then they poked out his eyes. They drug him off to Babylon. And that's where he died. And we look at this and we think, man, what a terrible end to a life. And in Romans, Paul writes, the wages of sin is death, right? Death is what creates, I'm sorry, sin is what creates these kinds of things. He ignored Jeremiah for 11 years and the consequences were severe. Now that brings us to verse 8. 
where Jeremiah now gives a message to the people of Judah from God. It starts in verse 8. He says, Now you shall say to this people, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. I actually want to pause there for a minute before we read the rest of the verse and move on through the rest of this chapter. This is what God has been doing to the human race since the Garden of Eden. He created Adam and Eve and he put them in a garden and in that garden was the tree of life and then there was another tree that was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil but we should call it the tree of death. And it's interesting that as you study Genesis, we never find Adam gravitating towards the tree of life or eating at the tree of life, but we find his wife gravitating towards the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, eating from it, giving some of the fruit, giving some of the fruit to Adam. And rather than choosing life, they chose death. And then you get to Moses. And as Moses is leading the children of Israel, he tells them, you can choose life by establishing a relationship with God and walking according to his word, or you can choose death by worshiping the idols of the land and living life any way you want to live it. Joshua comes along at the end of the book of Joshua, and he tells the people, he says, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, he says, we will serve the Lord. Elijah on Mount Carmel, and he's having a showdown with the 450 prophets of Baal because the people of Israel had chosen to worship Baal, Baal, instead of worshiping God. And Elijah looks and he says, choose this day whom you will serve. If Baal is God, we'll serve him. But if Yahweh is God, then serve him. But he says, choose today life or choose death. And as we go back to our text here, Jeremiah is instructed to tell the people in 21.8, he says, behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. And what God is doing is he's telling Jeremiah to instruct the people how to actually preserve their physical lives. They're beyond repentance at this point. We, we've turned that point. Pashur, arresting and beating Jeremiah was the turning point. Their judgment is now sealed. There's no chance for repentance. And what God is saying is judgment is coming. So you need to choose whether you want to live or you want to die. And he tells them, this is how you live. Look at verse 9. He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. If the Babylonians don't get you by sword, they're going to starve you to death. And if they don't get you by sword and starvation, you're going to die of all the diseases from the dead bodies laying around the street and stuff like that. He says, but he who goes out and defects to the Chaldeans, those are the Babylonians, who besiege you, he shall live and his life shall be as a prize to him. For I have set my face against this city for adversity and not for good, says the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon and he shall burn it with fire. And I want you to notice a couple of things here. God reminds the people of Judah that they were not only at war with the Babylonians, they were now at war with him. God basically says, I am opposing you. This is happening because I'm opposing you. I'm the one who brought the Babylonians. They are a tool of judgment in my hand. And then in verse 9, he says, the only way to survive would be to lay down your weapons, leave the city, and surrender to Babylon. And, and I want you to think about this. I want you to think about how the extreme patriots living in Judah at this time would have viewed Jeremiah. Because they and the prophets that they were following were saying, okay, God's going to help us. It's going to be like another David and Goliath moment. We're David, the Babylonians are Goliath, and, and God is just going to give us everything we need to run these Babylonians off. And so they're saying, fight for your nation, stand. And Jeremiah comes along and he says, listen, that all sounds really good. But if you want to live, you better lay down your arms, you better walk out of this city, and you better surrender to these Babylonians because once they start moving this direction, they're killing everybody. Whoever they don't kill, those people are going to die of starvation and pestilence. 
you realize that Jeremiah has just now labeled himself as a traitor to the nation. He's now labeled as a traitor, and in future chapters, I don't remember what chapter, but, but we'll actually read that this is the reason that they threw Jeremiah in the pit, is because he was telling the people, God is saying, surrender, go out, surrender yourself to the Chaldeans. And the others were saying, no, we're going to fight, we're going to fight. And there's some personal application here that I think we need to talk about. As we're looking at this whole situation, I think we need to remember that there are times when believers, I'm talking about you and I, when believers have ignored godly instruction and we've ignored correction from the Lord or from somebody that the Lord sends to speak to us, and then all of a sudden you find you're being opposed in unexpected ways by unexpected people or even by ungodly people. And you're asking, what in the world is going on? And these are those situations where the only solution is to surrender to the Lord. These are those times where you've got to say, listen, God is sending people, sometimes even ungodly people, to oppose me because I have gone an extended period of time being unteachable, uncorrectable, and the only hope is to surrender to God and get back in his will. Until then, God's going to allow even ungodly people to oppose you and to prevail over you. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a counseling session and someone is just laying out their story, and I'm thinking, oh, this is, this is Jeremiah 21. <laughs> you know, this is, this is where you don't see where you've sinned against the Lord, all you can see is where people are opposing you and this person's against me and this person's against me and this person's against me. And it's never going to change until you make things right with the Lord in your life. That brings us to verses 11 and 12 where Jeremiah speaks to King Zedekiah. Notice verse 11, and concerning the house of the king of Judah, say... Hear the word of the Lord, O house of David. This, this requires a little bit of explanation. I think you're probably tuning in here. But God has given a special message to a group of people that he calls the house of David. And this is the royal lineage of David. The, the men that God, that God called to rule over Judah. The lineage that came from David. And that eventually Messiah would come into the world through. And this includes... Zedekiah. And notice he says, thus says the Lord, execute judgment in the morning and deliver him who is plundered out of the hand of the oppressor, lest my fury go forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Now, throughout the Old Testament, God sent prophets to remind the various kings of Israel and Judah that part of their job was to administer justice and to do it fairly and to do it righteously. And throughout the Bible, we have all these kings who, once they got on the throne, all they did is enjoy all the pleasures of being in a, in a high-ranking position. We'll read about one a little bit later. But God is speaking, and he's saying, one of the reasons that I allowed you as a nation to have a king and to have a government and to have people who hold government positions is to administer justice in a righteous manner when it's necessary. And so God is speaking to the kings and he's saying, listen, you're not doing that. And I am going to hold you accountable. And so I really believe that God also expects that you and I who live in what we call a representative government, God wants us to be active in the political process. God wants us to remember that all authority is placed by him, but he wants us to be part of the process of putting people in office or sometimes taking action to try to get somebody out of office. If God is saying, hey, government exists to administer justice righteously, and we elect people into positions of leadership that are unqualified, and unwilling to do their job, then 
I believe God's going to hold us accountable for that. So this is what I always say, that as believers, we need to be active in the political process. In other words, there is no excuse for believers not to vote. And you can say, yeah, but there's nobody good to vote for. I know I've said that myself. But we are responsible to be part of the process. We're supposed to research the candidates and we're supposed to vote biblically. So if, if there's big issues, if you got one guy running for an office and you got another guy running for an office and this guy is promising that he's going to, you know, have a Ferrari in every garage at the end of four years. But he is for ungodly things like abortion and all sorts of other things. And then you got another guy over here and he says, listen, I'm going to stand up for the fatherless and the widow and the unborn, but I don't have quite as good a plan to put a Ferrari in your garage as this other guy. We need to make sure that we're voting for the guy that God would have us put in office. And if somebody else gets in office, well, that's one of those times where instead of just you know, firing off a Facebook post of how bad the president is or how bad this guy is, we actually do something about it. First, we pray. And then we would be willing to take action to do what's right. This is what God is saying here to the kings. He says, you, you better do what's right. And so he's saying to people like us, now to the people of Judah, they didn't, they didn't have a lot of choice. They didn't vote these kings in, but we get to vote our representatives in. And it's so important that we're part of the process. And I'm just going to move on. Verses 13 and 14, God speaks to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So he's spoken to the king. Then he's spoken to the office of king. And now he speaks to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I want you to notice what he says. He says, behold, I am against you, O inhabitant of the valley and rock of the plain. Those are just symbolic names for Jerusalem. Who say, who shall come down against us or who shall enter our dwellings? So even though Jeremiah had been preaching for 30 years that God was going to use Babylon to judge and destroy the city, the people of Jerusalem are basically saying, listen, who can come against us or who shall enter our dwellings? They're saying, we've got walls and we've got weapons and we've got an army. We're, we're good to go, right? God says this in verse 14. He says, I will punish you according to the fruit of your doings, says the Lord. I will kindle a fire in its forest and it shall devour all things around it. So God says, listen, you may be trusting in the fact that you're my people. You may be trusting in the fact that you've got walls and you've got weapons and you've got an army. And God says, you're going to find that your trust is in the wrong place. You should have trusted that Jeremiah was right and you should have taken action and you should have repented. And Gosh, there's so much we could say about this with our nation, isn't there? How often we look at the nation we live in and we're, we're secure because, you know, our economy is strong and our military is strong and this and that. And, and I wonder how often we have like a verse 13 where God is in heaven saying, listen, I'm against you because you trust in these things instead of doing things my way. And he basically says to the people of Jerusalem, he says, in just a short time, your city and its surroundings are going to be reduced to an ash heap. And we know that in 586, uh, Nebuchadnezzar did that. So that brings us to chapter 22, which we'll actually be able to move through a little bit quicker. We're going to take it in big chunks. We're going to call this a message to Judah's kings. Now, last week, chapter 21 took place. I'm sorry, the last chapter. Chapter 21 took place in the year 588 BC. It's about 17 years beyond what we studied last week in chapter 20. Now, as the book of Jeremiah often does, we jump to a time before chapter 20. And then we're going to jump back to where we are now. And so try not to get too lost in the details. Just look at the content because some of it's kind of hard. I want to prove to you that this is taking place here before the events of chapter 20. I'll read to you verses 1 through 5, and then I'm going to explain to you how we know the time of this. Look at verse 1 of chapter 22. Thus says the Lord, and of course he's speaking to Jeremiah. He says, go down to the house of the king of Judah, 
and there speak this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, you who sit on the throne of David, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates. I just want you to kind of put yourself in Jeremiah's shoes. Just, I mean, you're you and it's now. And you wake up one morning and the Lord says, I want you to drive to Washington, D.C. and I want you to just march into the White House. And I want you to walk right into the Oval Office where the president is sitting and I want you to say a few things to the president. Now, let's just say, hypothetically, that you could make it in there and talk. What's your next destination? Prison, right? And so I'm just trying to set the scene. This is another one of those things where Jeremiah goes, Nope, yes, sir. I'll do what you say, and I know you promised to protect me through the trials. So what do you want me to say? Okay, picture that. This is what... Jeremiah is supposed to say, verse 3, you're supposed to go to the king and say, thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the plundered out of the hand of the oppressor. Do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. Now pay attention to verse 4. For if you indeed do this thing, then shall enter the gates of this house, riding on horses and in chariots, accompanied by servants and people, kings, who sit on the throne of David. So let me just kind of give this to you. Jeremiah is supposed to walk into the king and say to him, if you will do your job righteously, take care of the fatherless and the widow and don't oppress people and do what your job requires of you, and if you will lead the people out of this sinful condition and into righteousness, God says, I'm going to extend the kingdom and the kings that come after you are going to be glorious and this nation is going to be amazing. But, verse 5, if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, so God is swearing an oath, that this house shall become a desolation. For thus says the Lord to the house of the king of Judah, you are Gilead to me, the head of Lebanon. Yet I surely will make you a wilderness, cities which are not inhabited. So Gilead and Lebanon, those are these glorious, massive forests. So God says, you're like a fortress right now, but when I'm done with you, if you don't repent, your city's not going to even be inhabitable. We're just going to level it. Verse 7, I will prepare destroyers against you, every one with his weapons. They shall cut down your choice cedars and cast them into the fire. And many nations will pass by this city. And everyone will say to his neighbor, Why has the Lord done so to this great city? And then they will answer, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and worshipped other gods and served them. Now a couple of things I want to show you. Chapter 20 last week brought us to a turning point where Jeremiah is no longer preaching, if you repent, God will relent. Those days are gone. But did you notice we just read that Jeremiah was supposed to tell the king, if you repent, God will relent. Did you catch that? So we know that this belongs before the turning point in chapter 20. You just got to look for those kinds of details. And so it's being shared out of chronological order. And so there's this message Jeremiah speaks to the king if you repent God will relent and we know that it didn't happen if they continued doing wrong God would destroy the city to the point where bystanders and neighbors would say hey weren't these the people of God why did their God destroy them and God says even the neighbors will know that I destroyed you because you did not keep my covenant you worshiped other gods and you did wickedly and so that was the past now we jump back into a series of messages that Jeremiah preaches to individual kings. And before we jump in, look up at the screen. I'm going to tell you who we're talking about. The story is going to begin with the good king, Josiah. He was the last good king of the southern kingdom. He ruled from 641 to 609 BC. He was killed in a war with Egypt. Now, if you look on the left side of the screen, his son, Jehoahaz, 
is also called Shalom. He reigned for just a few months in the year 609, and then we'll read about him. Next came Jehoiakim. He reigned from 609 to 598 BC. And then his son, Jehoiakim. How oh, these names. And they're so similar. He reigned for a very short time in 598. His nickname or his other name was Coniah. We're going to get all this in a minute. And then Zedekiah, who we started reading about, 597 to 587 BC. He's the king that was there when Nebuchadnezzar finally leveled the city. We're going to read about these guys real quick. And there's some good lessons here. So it begins in verse 10 with a prophetic message to a king named Shalom. Okay. Jeremiah says to Shalom, who is the son of the good king Josiah, he says, weep not for the dead, nor bemoan him. Weep bitterly for him who goes away, for he shall return no more, nor see his native country. For thus says the Lord concerning Shalom, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, who reigned instead of Josiah, his father, who went from this place. He shall not return here any more, but he shall die in the place where they have led him captive and shall see this land no more. Now look back at verse 10. Weep not for the dead, nor bemoan him. Josiah was the king that led Judah into this wonderful, beautiful time of spiritual revival. But at the, the time of his death, his son Jehoahaz, or Shalom, became king, and he was wicked, and it didn't take long for that revival to just come to a screeching halt. Jeremiah speaks to Shalom, Josiah's son. In verse 10, he says, don't weep for your dad. Your dad is dead. Your dad is in heaven. Don't weep for him. Rejoice for him. He says, you know who you should be weeping for? And picture Shalom going, who should I be weeping for? You should be weeping for yourself. Because in a short time, Pharaoh Necho, the guy who is responsible for your father's death is going to come for you. And he's going to get you. And you're going to be carried captive to the land of Egypt. And you're going to mourn for yourself because you're never going to see the land of Judah again. Look at the screen. 2 Kings 23 verses 31 through 34 record Shalom's end. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king. And he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutel, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, a different Jeremiah. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his fathers had done. Now Pharaoh Necho put him in prison at Riblah in the land of Hamath that he might not reign in Jerusalem. And he imposed on the land a tribute of 100 talents of silver and a talent of gold. Then Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in place of his father Josiah and changed his name to Jehoiakim. And Pharaoh took Jehoahaz, Shalom, and went to Egypt and he died there. And so we read there that Shalom, in the year 609, Jeremiah prophesies of his demise and three months later, He's taken captive to Egypt where he died. And the moral there, just like the rest of the story, is when you do wicked and God tells you to stop and you don't, the future's not going to be so good. Let's go on. The next message was preached about 598 or 597 to Jehoiakim, who was placed on the, king, on the throne uh, by Pharaoh Necho. He was chosen by Pharaoh Necho to reign in Judah because Pharaoh knew he could control Jehoiakim. Look at verse 13. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work, who says, I will build myself a wide house with spacious chambers and cut out windows for it, paneling it with cedar and painting it with vermilion. So the, the king comes along and instead of using the finances to care for his people, he's living high on the hog. Notice he's not paying people who work for him. 
And the Lord asks him a question in verse 15. He says, shall you reign because you enclosed yourself in cedar? In other words, are you a king because you're in a palace? And the Lord says, I don't think so. You're, you're not a king at all. You're just an imposter. He says, did your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and the needy. Then it was well. Was not this knowing me, says the Lord? So, so now God compares his grandfather Josiah with him. And he says, you know, your grandfather was a great guy. He proved he knew me because he did good to other people. He's talking about what we know as the book of 1 John, that, that love is something that we express because God lives within us. We can't call ourselves believers and hurt people and damage people. And that's what Jeremiah is saying to this guy. He says, your dad, your grandfather was the real deal and he proved it by the fact that he cared for the people. He says, you've come along and you're using all the nation's resources selfishly. You're building on the backs of others. He says in verse 17, yet your eyes and your heart are for nothing but your covetousness, for shedding innocent blood and practicing oppression and violence. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him saying, alas, my brother or alas, my sister. They shall not lament for him saying, alas, master or alas, his glory. He shall be buried with the burial of a donkey, dragged and cast out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. So God says this king is going to use all the resources for himself, but his end is going to be bad. He wasn't a servant leader. He was serving himself. And so look at 2 Chronicles 36, 5 and 7 up, 5 through 7 up on the screen we see the end of this king Jehoiakim. He was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against him and bound him in bronze fetters to carry him off to Babylon. That's that, like the death and the burial of a donkey. Nebuchadnezzar also carried off some of the articles from the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. And so just as Jeremiah prophesied, almost down to every detail, these things happened to him. And so we come to verse 20 through 23, and these are spoken to the general leaders of Judah. Uh, God is going to call them shepherds, but I don't want you to think of shepherds, and I don't want you to think of pastors. This word shepherds that's about to be used is speaking of the spiritual and the civil leaders in the nation of Judah that were supposed to shepherd God's people. And he says to them, uh, he says, go up to Lebanon and cry out and lift up your voice in Bashan. Cry from Abarim, for all your lovers are destroyed. He, he's saying, go to the lands where you used to worship these false gods. He calls them their lovers. And he says, you're going to see that they're destroyed. These idols that you worship, God says, I'm destroying your idols. Verse 21, I spoke to you in your prosperity, but you said, I will not hear. This has been your manner from your youth that you did not obey my voice. The wind shall eat up all your rulers and your lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then you will be ashamed and humiliated for all your wickedness. O oh, inhabitants of Lebanon, making your nest in the cedars, how gracious will you be when pangs come upon you like the pain of a woman in labor. So Jeremiah is just basically speaking to the civil and the spiritual leaders of the land, and he's saying you need to start mourning over your fate because God is about to judge your nation because, listen, he said, in your prosperity, you didn't respond to me. God, God says, in the, it's kind of like the Romans 5.8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And Jeremiah is saying to these people, he says, when God was blessing you, you didn't think about him. He says, but you're going to think about God when the judgment comes. And we should never be like those people who we only respond to God when he spanks us. We should be open to how the Lord leads us at all seasons. Verses uh, 24 here Jeremiah is going to preach to 
Jehoiakim. He's also known as Kaniah. In other books of the Bible, he's called Jeconiah. He's the son of Jehoiakim. And so verse 24, as I live, says the Lord, though Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet ring on my right hand, yet I would pluck you off and I will give you into the hand of those who seek your life and into the hand of those who face you, whose face you fear, the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the hand of the Chaldeans. So Jeremiah is using a word picture. You guys know what a signet ring is, right? A high-ranking official that worked for a king would have a signet ring. And let's say that he has to seal a document. He put some wax or clay, and then you press the signet ring, and it gives you the authority of the king, the authority of the kingdom. And God's using a word picture here. And he says, you know, even if you were the highest ranking official in my kingdom, he says, I'm about to strip you of your position and I'm about to give you into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. He, he speaks to the king and he just says, you think you're somebody, but you're nobody. And you're going down. Verse 26, I will cast you out and your mother who bore you into another country where you were not born, and there you shall die. But to the land to which they desire to return, there they shall not return. So now we read about Jehoiakim's end. It's in Second Chronicles 36, 9 and 10. It says here, Jeho Jehoiakim was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months and ten days, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. At the turn of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar summoned him and took him to Babylon with the costly articles from the house of the Lord. He made Zedekiah, Jehoiakim's brother, king over Judah and Jerusalem. So just as Jeremiah promised and prophesied, this guy, Jehoiakim, and his family were carried captive to Babylon along with more of the treasures of the temple. Hard chapter, huh? One message over and over and over. God warns, we need to respond. When we don't, these are the things that happen. God is always true to his word. If he says judgment is coming, judgment is coming. And he gives us this entire chapter of God spoke to this king. He didn't respond that guy died. God spoke to this guy. Guess what? He didn't respond. He died. God spoke to this king. He didn't respond. He died. It's just over and over and over. God is trying to get people's attention with this chapter and show them just how serious unrepentant sin is. Now, the chapter ends with something that is incredibly powerful and it ties us to next week, and it ties us to the New Testament. But the chapter is going to end with Jeremiah uttering a prophetic curse on the family of Jehoiakim, C-H-I-N, okay? Coniah or Jeconiah. Verse 28, God is speaking. He says, is this man, Coniah, a despised, broken idol? a vessel in which is no pleasure? The answer to that is yes. This guy is despised. He's a broken idol. There's no, God, God says, I have no pleasure in this man. He says, why are they cast out, he and his descendants, and cast into a land which they do not know? O oh, earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. So Jeremiah is using another word picture. I hope you picked up on it there. It's as if like a census taker has come to the door and, and he knocks on the door and he speaks to King Jeconiah and he says, hey, how many sons do you have? And we learn from 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 17, that he had seven sons. So the census taker says, hey, king, how many sons do you have? And he says, I've got seven sons. And then God speaks to that census taker and he says, I want you to write down these very words. 
And that is, this man is childless. Write down that he is a man who shall not prosper in his days. God is saying, although this guy has children, none of his children would ever sit on the throne of Judah. And as you read on, when Zedekiah came along, he was his uncle, not his son. And that was the end of the kings of Judah. And you may say, okay, Pastor Randy, I'm going to be honest with you. These were two really hard chapters to listen to tonight. And I would respond to you and I'd say, even harder to teach. And then you would say, Pastor Randy, what is the purpose of these two chapters in the big picture? Because all I heard tonight is this guy died and this guy died and this guy died and this guy died and this guy is never going to have a king sitting on the throne. I don't even get it. Well, actually, this entire chapter was especially chapter 22. Just like this past Sunday when we were studying Daniel chapter 11, we were moving through a story of people to bring us to that last character who was Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a type of Antichrist. In this chapter, this whole lineage brought us to this guy, Jeconiah, who was cursed to never have one of his sons sitting on the throne of Israel. And we look at this and we go, I still don't get it. Makes no sense. But I want to tell you that when this happened, in the corridors of hell, Satan and his cohorts were rejoicing. Because what they see in this, when God swears a curse and says, hey, Jeconiah will never have a son sitting on the throne of Israel. What they hear is the Messiah is never coming to earth. Because all throughout the scriptures, we're told that the Messiah is of the lineage of David. That the Messiah is going to come from that lineage of the kings of Judah coming through David. And this guy just got a curse from God saying that none of his sons are ever going to sit on the throne. And Satan thinks we thwarted the plan of God. By making this king, these kings, generation after generation after generation, wicked and rebellious, we stopped the plan of God to bring the Messiah, Savior, into the world. Except Satan's not that smart. He's not nearly as smart as he thinks he is. We know that God has been saying all throughout the Old Testament that he's going to put this king called Messiah on the throne of David who's going to rule from Israel during the millennium and his name is Messiah. We know him as Jesus, right? But we see this prophecy and we realize the Messiah's bloodline has been cursed. And so how do we get around this? Well, this prophecy had both immediate and long-range significance. It's true that no offspring of Jehoiachin uh, ever followed him to the throne. It was his uncle Zedekiah that was the last king. And God pruned away this portion of the line of David from the kingly line. But this prophecy also helps explain the genealogies of Christ in Matthew 1 and Luke chapter 3. Matthew gives this genealogy and he presents us with the legal line of Christ through his earthly stepfather, Joseph. And Joseph's line came through a guy named Shealtiel, who was the son of Jehoiachin. And that means had Christ been a physical descendant of Joseph, he would have been disqualified from being Messiah. Then Luke comes along and he presents the bloodline of Christ through Mary. Mary was a descendant of David through the line of his son, Nathan, instead of through the guy we just read about who was disqualified. So in that way, Jesus Christ was not under the curse of Jehoiakim, and therefore he's completely qualified to play the role of Messiah and Savior. And so you may go, wow, those were some hard chapters to get to for that good news. <laughs> and I know they were, but next week in chapter 23, Jeremiah will continue in this thought. He's going to take us through a study on the greatest king 
that will ever live that he calls the branch of righteousness. We know that it's Jesus. So I know tonight was a little bit hard to stick with. I appreciate that you made it through. That's the end of the two chapters. And when you come back next week, you're going to hear about the branch of righteousness. So let's pray. Father, if we take anything away from these chapters tonight, it is how seriously you take unrepentance and unconfessed sin in our lives. Lord, we see that over the course of almost 40 years, Jeremiah preached that judgment was coming and, and the people just continued to ignore and they refused to repent of their sin. And we read this and we see the judgment that came. But Lord, how easy it is for us in our own personal lives to ignore when you're speaking to us about things that are going to lead to some kind of death. Lord, it could be the death of a marriage. It could be the death of a friendship. It could be the death of a relationship. It could actually be, Lord, that our sin leads to carelessness and it leads to a death of a person. Ultimately, Lord, if there's anybody listening that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, they're ignoring the work of the Spirit in their life right now would lead to what your word calls eternal spiritual death. Spending eternity separated from you, separated from your love, separated from your light in a place where we pay for our own sins because we were too stubborn to receive the finished work of Jesus Christ and his righteousness as a gift. Lord, don't let anybody hearing my voice right now continue in that place of being unforgiven. Rather, Lord, let them turn to Jesus and have their sins forgiven. For those of us who know Christ as our Savior, Lord, and we're walking in some kind of, of un recognized, unconfessed, unrepentant sin, and it's leading to brokenness and to death in our lives. Father, I, I pray that you would speak one more time tonight, Lord, that we would hear that this would be the time that we make a decision to recognize your voice, to recognize the destruction that sin is bringing into our lives, and to turn from it, Lord. God, we just thank you. I thank you for this group that comes out every Wednesday night, Lord, to hear these hard studies in the book of Jeremiah. Lord, what a blessing it is to see such a faithful group of people, Lord, that love your word and that love you. And we pray tonight, Lord, that whatever you spoke to us, Lord, would let it take root deep in our hearts and it would grow to a harvest of righteousness in our lives. I pray tonight, Lord, that there would be something that we walk out of this room with knowing that you are speaking to us about making a change in our life, a change that's going to bring fruit. And so, Lord, we just thank you and we praise you. We look forward to the amazing work you'll continue to do in our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.